For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We're in the 11th Toledoth. You're familiar with that now. And uh, if those who might be visiting with us from the Internet are not familiar with that, then you could go back and pick up. But it's Genesis 37, 2 through the 50th chapter, verse 26. If you're not familiar with Toledoths, then go back and study some of our other lessons. That will help you. And we're in 38. The 11th Toledoth, every chapter talks about Joseph. I mean, he is a central theme of the 11th Toledoth. And, of course, we have studied how his dream is the central theme of his, of his life. And, therefore, of the 11th Toledoth. But there is one chapter that he's not mentioned in, but Judah, it's all about Judah. Judah. And I'm going to show you how you can get into a funky place in your life that is carnality and reversionism. And you can begin making bad decisions and one bad decision, mistake we would call it, one bad decision just leads to another one and you get in this terrible cycle of making bad decisions that have consequential um, that have great consequences to them. We call them consequential mistakes. They're not without paying some heavy duty. You'll hear people talk about consequential mistakes by saying you ruined your life. That's a consequential mistake. You've ruined the, I mean, you, you just ruined your life. You know? Well, in this passage, we've got Judah, and he's eaten up with guilt. He is not willing to correct his mistakes he's already made. For example, conspiring against Joseph, selling him into slavery as opposed to death. But why not draw the sword and protect him? Right? I mean, so he starts off, everybody wants to kill him, he comes up with, let's sell him. Now, now, now he's, he's lighting off one right after another. Then they cover up that. They cover up the sin with evil. Remember, with the bloody coat, takes it back to his dad, and his dad drops into deep mourning. Listen, they continued all the way until Joseph was identified to being alive. We're talking 22, 23 years. This man was in deep mourning. And Judah knows he's alive, could have told him, didn't, and let that man grieve for 23, 24 years. And he could have fixed it. But he didn't. He didn't. And so he is having difficulty living with these, and now he just begins to make mistakes beyond that. In verse 38, and it came about at that time, that time, I just explained to you, that's chapter 37. It came about at that time, this Joseph incident and then Jacob incident in the cover-up, that Judah departed from his brothers. Now, I can't tell you how many people think that if you, ch if you change your geography, it will change your problems. If you... 
Listen, you might be able to change your underwear to do that. But that's about the only change that's going to work for you. You start running from the geographical will of God because of the directive tells you, you know, the directive will of God, you got it's got to be geographical, operational, mentally tied together. They're all tied together. Judah, when he runs, he has violated the directive will of God that says to, that says to Judah, you are heir apparent to the lineage of Christ, right? Now, he wasn't the firstborn. He was the fourth. But his older brothers, Reuben, Simeon, and Levi, forfeited it by bad behavior. Right? You know the story. If you don't, go back and read it. It's well worth your reading. All of a sudden, he's fourth in line. He's fourth in line, and he becomes first. He is heir apparent to the Abrahamic covenant seed. This is a big deal. This is birthright stuff. This is what Esau sold out on. This is a big deal. And he's about to throw it under the bus. I tell you, never mess with the direct will of God in your life. Never mess with it. Don't think that, that you can violate it and then change your location and the geographical will doesn't apply. Listen, as heir apparent to the Messiah and lineage, he's got to be in the land. The Abrahamic covenant says, in the land, as the seed, right? So what's he do? He, he leaves it. He leaves his family. How can you, listen, he, look. He's heir apparent, right? He's first, he has firstborn rights to the Messiah, right? Okay. That puts him into the fullness of the Abrahamic covenant. I mean, now he's, that's his directive will. He, that's how he's supposed to operate. And listen, he is to operate in that regard as part of 12 tribes. Not one. Not none. He just pulled up stakes and left. Can't do that. 12 tribes. Well, well, he 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 departs he departs from his brothers and visits a certain Adolamite whose name was Hira. And boy, I'll tell you, every time you find him and Judah together, Judah's not doing well. You know, there's some people that are just fun to be with, but they're worldly. They're whirly. If they're whirly, I say they're squirrely. <laughs> and they're going to get you in a peck of trouble. And every time that he's running with this guy, he's in trouble. Well, Judah's with him. And there he saw a daughter of a certain a Canaanite whose name was Shula. And he took her and went into her. Took her as his wife. And she conceived and bore a son, and he, he named him Er. Then she conceived again, and she bore a son and named him. Now, I'm going to tell you something. It should be she named him Onan. She bore still another son, and she named him Sheila. Right? What, what is that song? Is that Sue, a boy called Sue. A boy, remember that old Western song? And she bore him. Look, now look, how many sons does Judah have? Well, he's three. Three in this story. He has three in this story. Okay? One, the first one he names, the firstborn he names, and after that, who names them all? She does. She takes control of this thing. She takes control. That's a big point. And it was Shazak, 
that she bore him. Now Judah, that's as far as I'm going to go. Then we go into another mess. We go into another mess. Okay, another mess. Look, when you read the the genealogy of Jesus Christ in Matthew one and Luke three, it goes to Judah. It goes Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah. It's in Matthew 1. It's in Luke 3. It's discussed this way in Romans, the fourth chapter. When Paul gets into this and talks about the Abrahamic covenant, you want to you wanna pay special attention to verses 13 through 16 when you read that because the seed of the Messiah, who Judah is responsible for, is the heir of the world. In Galatians, the third chapter, verse 16, it says that the seed of the Abrahamic covenant is Jesus Christ historically. <laughs> In the Old Testament, he was called Christ. In the New Testament, he, Christ was given the, the personal name, Jesus, because he would save his people from a sin, right? Galatians 3.16, Paul identifies that. But what is interesting is for Judah to get back into the Messianic lineage. It's not going to be through Shula. It's going to be through Tamar. And that's going to be a mess. But the difference is, is this. Judah and Tamar, even though their relationship is a mess, she's a believer, just like him. And Shula isn't. Now, both these women are Canaanites. Canaanites. They, they, they are involved in their culture in a pagan religion of the Phalic cult. In other words, their worship was centered around sex, the fertility god. Mm. He marries two Canaanite women. One becomes a believer. Tamar becomes a believer. Shula never does become a believer. And Tamar is mentioned in Matthew's genealogy. Agreed? Ah, uh, yeah. You know, the women are mentioned in that genealogy, and we've got, we got Tamar in there. We've got Tamar. Now, here's what I love about the new covenant. See, the old covenant was earmarked by exclusive they excluded people new covenant doesn't exclude anybody doesn't exclude anybody we include everybody we'll take anybody we take anybody and Paul and listen and Paul makes that very clear in Galatians the third chapter 26 through 29 he said neither Jew nor Gentile male or female right free or slave etc and then in verse 29, he says, and anybody in Christ is an heir of Abraham. How about that? That put Tamar in. Didn't put Shua, but put Tamar. That's kind of just kind of interesting. So the question might be, as you study the story with Judah, does he know that he's heir apparent? Of course he does. He knows he's firstborn rights to the Messiah. He knows that. Be pretty clear. His older brothers didn't have it anymore. He got it. Then why would Judah go against the word of God? Why would he do that? Well, for the same reason you would. <laughs> you know, sin has its pleasure as well as its kickback. And we somehow always think that the pleasure will outweigh the kickback. That somehow I might get away with it. And that ain't going to happen. And that's to your benefit. And so this is Judah. 
why would he go against the word of God? Because he's already, he already, why would he marry an unbeliever? Especially one like this. Why would he do that? Because he's already in a series of bad choices as a believer. He's already made several choices against the will of God. He had already made choices against Joseph. He had already made choices against Judah. And now that series just continues. So I want to talk about four things about Judah's decision to become unequally yoked. I mean, after you sell your brother and, and throw your dad under the bus, I guess, you know. Everything else is fair game, I guess. I mean, how dumb can you get? He's, a, he's dumb as a brick. Unequally yoked in marriage. So, you know, sells his brother off, throws his dad under the bus, goes out and marries a heathen. Life is good. Life is good. Hmm. Our lesson, point one, our lesson takes place with Judah in the wrong place, with the wrong people doing the wrong things. Guess what? He's out of the will of God. Duh. I mean, how do you know you're out of the will of God? Wrong places, wrong people doing wrong things. That's how you know. And somewhere you got to correct that. It's going to catch up with you. And when it catches up, it's going to be tough. Because the more you add to it, the heavier the load. He was out of the directive will of God of the Abrahamic covenant. He has firstborn rights and he's, he's thrown it out. Remember the three categories that are associated with the directive will of God is the geographical, operational, and mental. He's in the wrong place. He ought to be in the land. He ought to be in the land. He shouldn't. He should be at Hebron, and he's at Adullam. He ought to be with his people. He ought to be with God's people. He shouldn't be with the wrong people. He shouldn't be with heathens. He shouldn't be running with them. That's the fast crowd. Let me tell you, the fast crowd is always faster than you are. That's why they call the fast crowd. Well, by, by now, you must know that. Uh, you must know that. And uh, the mental will of God, they're doing, doing the wrong things. But like I said, after you sell your brother into slavery and throw your dad under the bus, everything else is kind of like walking the cake. Walk, walk in a park or someplace where you're walking. <laughs> Judah left the directed will of God for the wrong reasons. I don't know what the two is in there about. For Oh, I know what it is. For all the wrong reasons. I missed the A. Judah left the directive will of God for all the wrong reasons. He internalized his family problems rather than address them personally and quickly. I mean, don't hang on to your sin. Confess it and get rid of it. It's already been taken care of. It's just a bugaboo in your life. Confess it and move on. I mean, you know, it, it's amazing to me. Apparently, God's not shocked at anything we do. <laughs> I mean, most of us, we, we, would, we, would, we would tear the hide right off of you. But apparently, he's not shocked at all. I mean, I hear, apparently, he's not shocked at all. I mean, look, he puts up with us. He allows us to come back, confess our sin. To be honest with him. While you may think that your sin is not as bad as somebody else, it put Christ on the cross. That's as bad as it gets, isn't it? So don't 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 try to play the holier and thou card with God because it don't work with him. Okay, so don't pull that card out. Run it away will only compound his problems. You can't run from the directive will of God and think you're gonna come out smelling like a rose. Copying out rather than coping is the wrong way to go. I see so many Christians cop out rather than to cope out. 
cope with your problems. They're personal. God's personal. You're not going to shock them. You are not going to shock them. Listen, he hung everything you could possibly shock him with on Christ on the cross. I love this in the verse, first verse, and it came about, I find that comforting in my soul. He's not shocked at what I confess to him I've done. He's not shocked. I mean, where do you think he's been? He, as soon as you... Pop that thought in your head, well, I'm going to go do such a thing. God says, well, I'll see you after this thing's over. How can that be? Because the Holy Spirit is always with you. He can never leave you. Doesn't mean he participates in it because you're in the, you're in the flesh, not in the spirit. But running away. Come on. Running away. Listen. You know, you can run away from one side of the bed to the other. You can run away from not sleeping in that room you ought to be sleeping in and sleep in another room to make a point. You know what that point is? Stupidity. What are you talking about? You know what short sheeting is? Could I recommend you never do that if you're married? That short sheeting works at camps. It don't work at all in marriage. I hear some of the most crazy stories. To get back at people they're married with Put a dead mouse in the bed and all kinds of things. How do you think that's going to work out good for you? Well, it made a point. Who would imagine what point that would be? I'll tell you what it is. It's about running from responsibility with the Lord. Don't do that, people. Pout. That's short sheeting. Pout. Where did that get you? Another day later and deeper in debt. Matthew's genealogy records J Judah, the fourth in the Messianic lineage of Jesus Christ. Luke does the same thing. Judah was also fourth in the family. By natural birth, fourth. So how did Judah, as the fourth son of Jacob, receive, receive firstborn rights? Because his other brothers were stupider than he was. And would man up. Now here's Judah, fourth in the line. Judah describes him in Genesis 49.10. Now I'm in 38, so. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is chapter 38. By the time we get to 49.10, this it's going to say about Judah, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, which is Christ, and to him shall be the people. Revelation, the fifth chapter, verse 5, brings this subject up, talking about the return of Christ. The Lion of Judah. Sylvia Dennis gave me a, one of the all-time great gifts. I have it hanging in my living room, and it's a head of a lion that has this quote on it. And every bit of it, every bit of the picture of the lion is, the, is this written. It's all written. There's no drawing. The whole thing is about that. One verse by somebody that just was artistic. And people look at it and say, well, that's a pretty picture. I'd say, we walk up closer and see what it really is. It's the word of God about Jesus Christ, the Lion of Judah. 
it's one of the one of the pictures I cherish. The second point I'd like to make to you is as heir to the Messianic lineage, Judah chose to marry a Canaanite unbeliever of the failing cult religion. In the promised land, where he ought to be, they were the arch enemy of the plan of God for Israel. They were the arch enemy. I mean, they were number one enemy. He leaves Israel and goes and marries this person. In the story of their marriage, she was just a hot tamale. I mean, this guy was so flesh. Listen. You guys are right? Too late to, too late for this, but listen. And those of us who are married, you need to listen to me. Marriage is based on three things. And you they've got to be in sync with the Word of God. Because we are, we, listen, we are body, soul, and And they have to all jive within that marriage. It can't be all body and no spirit and soul. It can't be all soul without spirit and you understand what I'm saying? Those three things in the Word of God have to work in unison with the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. And when they do, your marriage is going to be phenomenal. And when they don't, your marriage is going to be oh so so. And I can't get people to understand that. And that I, that's 1 Thessalonians 5.23, by the way. Uh, and I, I can't understand why you don't understand that. And when you, make it, when you make your marriage a one issue, if it's just body or if it's just soul or if it's just spirit, it can't be just one thing. It has to be these three things have to work in unison. And that's very important. And, and you'd be amazed if you, could, if you could understand that in your marriage and bring that into your marriage. The unison of, what's the Bible say about the flesh and marriage, the body and marriage? What does it say about the soul and marriage? What's it say about it? Listen, the Bible has a great deal to say about it. I think some people don't read it because ignorance is bliss and they, get, they can use it as an excuse to do stupid stuff. That's my opinion. I'm a little cranky tonight, ain't I? Am I cranky a little bit tonight? All right. So he marries a Canaanite unbelieving of the, fail of the pagan Fali cult. And listen to me. You watch Judah from this point. Judah. Now, you watch Judah from this point. He has tasted the, unfor he's, he's tasted the forbidden fruit. And it's going to die. Listen, it be, that pattern that pattern in his life became part of his old, and that was one of them for him. Was he familiar with the doctrine of unequally yoked? That he should marry as a believer, should marry an unbeliever? You suppose he was? Absolutely. Let me tell you something. He knew it as clear as you do out of 2 Corinthians. I want you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians the sixth chapter, and here's what's missed by New Testament people. They don't pay attention to quotes. They don't pay attention to them. And, and I suppose that's all right, but if you are, then it makes it more interesting when you have a passage like we're in tonight. Well, in the sixth chapter, I'm 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Let me get 6, 14. In mine, the New American Standard, it says, do not be bound together with an unbeliever. King James had it right. King James says, do not be unequally yoked. Now, if you have a study Bible, 
If you have a study Bible, you should have Deuteronomy 22.10. It's either, it's either in cross-reference or in your footnotes. Do you have it somewhere like that? It should be. Because this unequally yoked is a, is a, is a quote idea, it's a doctrinal principle that comes from Deuteronomy 22.10, which says you shouldn't yoke two things that aren't natural to be yoked. You know, a cow and a dog or something, you know. That's what it means to be unequally yoked. And you see, my point is this. Where did this New Testament idea come? It's a doctrinal principle from the Old Covenant carried into the New Covenant. It, it, it's apropos for that because it deals with marriage and business dealings and things like that. Now, Judah, has he knew this. This was part of a very clear teaching, just like you understand uh, 2 Corinthians 6.14. He understood that, but he doesn't care. I mean, I've already sold my brother. I've thrown my father under the bus. Who cares? And that's apparently his attitude because he is, he is now violating all kinds of things. The Bible made it very clear in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. Unbelievers don't, don't uh, a believer doesn't marry an unbeliever. You don't do it willfully. You don't do that. It, it was very clearly taught. Notice I put the Greek word for bound together or unequally yoked. See the, see the H-E-T-E-R-O? That's heteros. It means of a different kind. You don't put two different kinds together and yoke them up and do that. You don't put a cow and a dog and think you're going to plow the field all day. All right? And then the word Z-U-G-E-O -Z was the word yoked. Unequally yoked is the word. It's a word in the Greek language. Believers are not to be bound together. This is true in the business world as well as marriage with unbelievers. Now look, what a believer is supposed to do is marry a believer. 1 Corinthians 9, 5, Paul says, do we, talking about himself and Timothy, Titus, guys like that, do we not have a right to take along a believing wife even as the rest of the apostles and the brothers of the Lord, for example, Cephas, Peter? Well, of course you do. You have a right. He surrendered that right. Uh, he surrendered the supreme law of love for Christ not to get married. That was a choice he made. Could he have gotten married? Yes. But he chose not to. Because his life in ministry for Christ was his marriage. He didn't have time for anything else. It wouldn't be fair for him to take a wife and not give her the, the time nor what it was. There wasn't enough hours in a day for him to even to consider that. So he didn't. Did he have a right to? Yes. 1 Corinthians the 7, chapter 39 says, Believers are supposed to only marry believers. It's amazing to me how many Christians in the church do not know that. Judah married without, listen, not only that, but Judah married without parental approval, which was a big deal, without family support, which was a big deal, or without family attendance. He shut them all out. Let me tell you, when, when you go to marry somebody and they try to shut all of these type of things out of your life, you're with the wrong person. You should you should bail out before you get married. Yeah, that's a control freak. Or he's running from something, Judah. You're running from something. Because this ought to be a day where everybody is pretty excited. But listen, he's on the run. But who is he running from? He's, listen, he's running from God. And listen to me, worst of all... If that's, not, if that's not bad enough, he's running from himself. He hates himself. This is punishing himself. All of this, do you think the brothers don't care that they weren't invited? No, but he's not going to get invited to mine, 
right? That's probably the brother's attitude. Now, should this have been an important issue? Yes, because of the 12 tribes. It's a big deal. This is really a big deal. The Abrahamic covenant is really a big deal. Um, here's the third thing. An unequally yoked marriage leads to an unequally yoked parenting family. Now you got a mess. Now you have a mess. In Genesis 38.3, just show you the, the Hebrew language. Judah named his firstborn heir. It is the Greek word kala. He called the word call or name, kala. Cal, imperfect, third masculine, singular. I put it in bold print. In verses 38, in, verse thir in chapter 38, verses 4 and 5, Shula names the second and third son. How do I know it? Because the same word is third feminine singular. Power of the wonderful language. See, you're not going to see that anywhere else. While a carnal reversionistic believer may seem compatible with an unbelieving mate in their single life or pre-family, it will soon come to a head with, with the family and worship. It will come to a head. I can't tell you how many times I've been engaged over my years in ministry with unequally yoked people who got along perfectly in their carnality and reversionism as single people who now have got kids and feel responsible for their training and their worship and their religion. And they can't come to any agreement on how to raise kids. They can't come to agreement on what church they ought to go to, how they should be raised, or etc. And they're in a mess. Just recently, I talked to a, a businessman like that. And he's beside himself because he wants his children raised religiously while he himself, his parents raised him and then he ran away, you know what I mean, from his faith. Married a person, and while they were single, and while they were married without family, it didn't matter. But now he's got kids. He cares about how they're going to be raised religiously. And she doesn't care a thing about it and doesn't want it. And they're in a mess. They're in a mess. They're in a mess. Well, the only way to change this is for the carnal reverse next to believer to become spiritual in his personal life and evangelical towards his mate in prayer and gospel and be willing to take the heat for it. <laughs> Paul says, he's in 1 Corinthians 7. I didn't put that, but he's in 1 Corinthians 7. He says, but to the rest I say, not the Lord, that if a brother has a wife who is an unbeliever, in other words, they got married, one of them gets saved, now, now that's what you got. They didn't go into it that way, this is what happened. One got evangelized. If a brother, a saved male, has a wife who is an unbeliever, and she consents to live with, live with him without making his religious and religion an issue, he must not divorce her. A woman who has an unbelieving husband and he's consent and he consents to live with her, her religion, she must not divorce him. And then Paul goes on in this first Corinthians passage. This is in the eventually you're going to see that I'm in seventh chapter twelve through sixteen. He goes on to say, For the unbelieving husband is set apart or sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified, set apart through her believing husband. You know what you got? You got a believer in the family. You got somebody that can share the gospel from the inside. You got a missionary. You got to live in missionary. For otherwise, your children aren't clean, but now they're holy. In other words, they too have been set apart. 
unto the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are they saved? No, but have they got a great chance of it? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, your children aren't saved because you're a believer. They're saved when they become a believer. But your children are under the influence of a spiritual uh, uh, dinosphere. And that's important. And when you don't, and so when you, and I've, I read this passage of this man. I said, bring your wife in. He, she won't come. I said, well, love her in. You can love your wife, love your wife into this. We'll see. Apparently, he didn't understand that either. If the unbelieving one leaves over this issue, if the believing one, if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or sister is not under bondage in such case, such case but God has called us to peace. By bondage means. That if that person leaves, divorce you, then you have rights to remarriage. That's what that means. But listen, he says, how do you know, O oh wife, whether you can save your husband? Or how do you know, O oh husband, whether you will save your wife? See, that's the point. That's why it's important to be in there if they're consentable to stay in that marriage and be that influence for Christ on the inside. That all comes from 1 Corinthians 7, chapter 12 through 16. Finally, the Bible says, do not be bound with an unbeliever and tells you why. Note the five reasons given by Paul that are diabolically opposites. Notice marriage, marriage or contractual agreements between two people is a partnership. It's fellowship. It's harmony. It's being in common with and in agreement with. You understand? Now, in order to have that, you need to have two believers. Because righteousness will have, on the one hand, you got a believer who is into righteousness. On the other hand, you got a person, unbeliever, who is in lawlessness. On the one hand, you have a person who is in divine light. And on the other hand, you got a person who is in darkness. On the one hand, you have Christ. On the other hand, you have Beelzebub or Satan. On the one hand, you have a believer that has common interests with the things of Christ. And you have an other believer that can't come to that, can't come to understand because a natural man cannot understand spiritual things. And what agreement has the temple of God, which is the Holy Spirit in my life, with the idols? Because that's what you have. That's why this is a bad idea, Paul says. Now, in closing my subject up for you today, all three of these sons of Judah will not qualify for messianic genealogy of Matthew 1. They will all die. And then Shula will die. None of them, none of them have a right to the airship. The messianic lineage is about to be, listen to me, this is important now. The messianic lineage with Judah is about to be shut down from the believer's side if it wasn't for the overruling will of God. And God is going to have to take a nutcase. And there's going to be four funerals in this man's life. And he's still not going to be in the game. Four funerals. He's going to bury three sons and a wife. And still does not understand anything about what God wants out of his life. I mean, that's an idiot. And God is going to have to pull the overruling will of God because this man will not respond to the direct will of God in his life. And there's a lesson to be learned here in your life and mine. There's a lesson here for all of us. We need to listen to it. I mean, we're, we're one decision away from 
be in a mess like Judah's. When, the, you're gonna, when we go through this chapter, you're going to see a guy that just is in self-destruction. This is self-destruction. I mean, every, every decision he's making is Russian roulette. You know, pfft, pfft. Father, we're so thankful tonight for these that have come our way by automobile and satellite. Uh, what a interesting day I live in. I understand the automobile. I don't understand anything about the rest of it. I just know somehow it flows through the air and there we are in China and Russia and <laughs> Afghanistan. We're all over the place and I just enjoy the journey, Father. I'm just along for the ride. I pray you continue to teach us the truth that we might speak it out of our hearts. That we show them in the Word of God what it says and be truthful with it. Not try to hide anything from our life from it. Be open and truthful. Not to be a Judah. Be a follower of Christ, not a follower of Judah. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.